we discussed last time the rise of the modern state because today we live in the world of states and I ended on the note that today if you look at the map it seems that it's a world of states which means that in fact there is no not one uh, significant inhabitable space on this whole globe that is not assigned at least formally to a state we have we have divided this entire globe into nicely drawn patches but do they exist I mean are these you know realities well as we've seen these are these are a model the state represents a model that was basically invented the way we the way it works today only about 200 years ago and mostly shaped <coughs> in, in Europe in the last 300 400 years and that's nothing historically speaking of, as in you, and you've seen the map of the world before and th basically throughout history so this is a recent construct does it have to be this way no it doesn't have to be this way no, I, we don't know how it will look in 200 years 400 years a thousand years but since today we live in a world of states, which means that almost every single person in this world is assigned to a state, as we'll see, we need to understand what a state is. And when we study politics, we study states nowadays. So what is a state then? What is a state? The simplest definition, and I uh, again uh, urge you to uh, read the Danziger chapter from, from the textbook but I'm giving you more and different definitions and I do expect you to know these and use them so Danziger is just for reference so what is a state? Right? As, we, as we noticed it has a clear territorial dimension which means that clearly part of the state of what you understand as a state is a territory right? but who decides, who shapes, who um, defines this territory. Well, it is what? A set of institutions that we usually call government. So, a set of institutions, right, which have sovereign power over a territory, and not only over a territory, but also over a membership, over a people. And this is very important to understand that these are two different things. So what is a state? A state is a set of institutions, I don't know how many, I don't know how shaped, in sovereign control or sovereign power, in exclusive, uh, exercising exclusive power, right, over what? A territory and a membership. And these are two different things. Why? Well, you, let's say you are an American, uh, a citizen of the United States of America, which is a state itself. The United States already is actually a state. What we call states here are, well, that's a misnomer and uh, with, with very specific reasons in, in American history, but they're, they're regions actually, they're provinces. The state is the United States of America. Canada is a state, although it's a federal state as well. So, <clears throat> if you are an, uh, an, a US citizen, right? Do you, do you lose your citizenship when, when you cross the border to go to Canada or to Mexico or whatever? No. If you go to Mexico and something happens to you, let's say you, know, uh, you lose your passport, you, uh, you're robbed something, where do you go? Or you're accused of doing something. Where do you go? You go to the embassy of what? Of uh, uh, Canada? Do you go to the embassy of Iceland? No, to the, the embassy of the United States. Why? Because your quality is that of being a member in this state, of this state. And this membership remains no matter whether you live within this territory that it controls or somewhere else. And you can live your whole life in different territories, right? Your membership is your relationship with the state. And what is the name of this membership? Citizenship. Right? So what, does, what is a state? A state is a set of institutions, I don't know how many, you know, several, one, I don't know, how they're arranged. We're not saying if they're democratic or not or whatever. A set of institutions who exercise sovereign power over what? Over a territory, so they control a territory. And they control whoever enters, whoever exits into this territory. and. Uh, 
everybody who is within the territory, no matter to who, to which state they belong, right? Even if people are not citizens of, let's say, the United States, it's the United States that controls the territory, no matter who is in it. Citizens of many countries can be in it, right? So a set of institutions in sovereign control over territory and over a what? Membership. And that's different. And how do we call this membership? And these members might be here or there or elsewhere. We call it citizenship. Citizenship is your membership in the state. And what is the sign that you're a citizen? What is, what is the, how can you prove that you're a citizen? The passport, right? So you're assigned, every human being on earth, basically, is assigned to a state. And because we live in a world of states in which not one inhabitable piece of land that of any, you know, uh, worth, basically, uh, except for some, you know, remote you know, luxury islands that you can buy or something. But even those. Um, they are all assigned to a state. We live in a world of states. So the worst, th the worst thing that can happen today for a person is to what? To lose citizenship. There is this movie, I don't know if you know about it, you remember it, the, the Terminal from the 1990s with Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks, uh, it's a true story. Uh, Tom Hanks plays a uh, the, the role of a person who is stranded in a French airport for 20 years. I, I don't think it's a French airport in the movie, but that's the real case for I don't know how many years. Well, the real story is that that person was stranded there for, I don't know, 12 or 15 years. How? And why? Why couldn't he enter the territory? Because he landed there when he was a citizen of a, of a state, but that state crumbled and, the, and he never, re, he lost citizenship and he never regained, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's say he was a citizen of, I don't know, uh, uh, the country of Borat, right? right? So the country of Borat falls apart, he loses citizenship, but what is his sp status? And this is a key aspect. Your you, you know, we talk about rights, we have rights, we have freedoms, we have liberties. We don't. We don't have any of these things, right, unless someone grants them to us. Because uh, when you say you have rights, you demand that something, some entity, well, delivers those rights. And you demand them from whom? From your government. Right? Yours meaning what? From the set of institutions to whom, in, in whom, or with whom you have this relationship of membership. You're a member in, to, in, in a club, and it is that membership that gives you rights, and who provides them? Who provides the protection that you call rights and freedoms and whatever? It's a government. That was the irony of the French Revolution, right? That democracy, quote-unquote, equality, freedom, was actually established, was actually gained through the establishment of a very strong central government that controls everything. You want to be free? It means that you want to be controlled. It's only this sovereign control of territory and membership that allows for a regulated, ordered space, right, within which the individual member says, oh, well, I have these rights. Why? Because I have membership. It's my citizenship that gives me rights. So a person who loses, that, uh, who loses citizenship, right, uh, as that person uh, that I was telling you about in the airport, and it's a real case, and never gains another one, he is a patriot. He doesn't have a citizenship, and that is the worst thing that can happen to you in the world, because you're nobody's, and, and nobody cares for you. Who do you go to? The UN? The UN doesn't have the force to, uh, to, to uh, grant you anything. Because the UN is not a state. And we're going to talk about the UN. It's the state. Only the state. And it's a world of states. And you can't go anywhere physically. You can't, can't go anywhere because there are always borders. You need to cross them. We're caught in a web of states. That's our freedom. Right? And it is what? What do we show at the border crossing? Our passport. We show this membership in our own state and say, oh well, my state, my club has an agreement with your club that I can come into you, the territory that you command. Quite caught up, right? Well, when we saw the map before of the world, all those, you know, white patches or those fluctuating shape, it meant that there were no such solid borders, that it was much more porous, and as I was telling you, Nobody there was no citizenship in the French 
stay before the revolution because nobody cared. You went to stay there, yes, good, you paid your dues, you became part of the society or not, or nobody cared. Right? There, wasn't, there wasn't this idea of separate little clubs. And whose clubs, whose club is this in the United States of the Americans? Right? What is the Americans? Well, that will take us to the, or French or Germans or whatever. That's the invention, as we talked about yesterday, of the nation. Because you have to define who is in and who is out. You have to define who gets this. Who gets membership? Because it's not people who were born there, you know very well. You can be born, uh, 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 I mean, it's, you can get it without being born there. The rules of obtaining membership, the rules through which each state, each set of institutions that govern a territory in the membership, the rules through which they give membership in their, uh, they grant membership, differ. And what does it depend on, you know, why, why, what, what are these different rules? What does it depend on? It depends on their understanding of nationhood. And that's different. Because the state and nation are not the same thing. And we're going to talk about this in a second. So state is a set of institutions in sovereign control over territory and the membership. There are other uh, uh, definitions that you can remember. It's the organization, the state is, that has the monopoly of violence over a territory. It's only the state that can legitimately use violence in a territory or that can set the rules of who can use violence, right? The police belongs to the state. The military belongs to the state. These are legitimate tools of violence. The legitimate use of coercion and force. Um, it is the ultimate source of what? Law, which is what? Order. It is the ultimate authority. It is the Leviathan. So that's the state. So I mentioned the word here and it's important to define it. So we define the state, let's define sovereignty. And right? that's an important word that I, I used knowingly. Sovereignty is the ability of carrying out policies and actions within a territory independently from external or internal rivals. So what is sovereignty? The ability to exercise power, yeah, to do you know, internal policies, actions, to exercise power in a territory exclusive of, independently from any external or internal rivals. Sovereignty means that this set of, this, this set of institutions is uniquely in power over a territory and a membership. And you remember now sovereignty from our discussion, from our previous discussion, how it was a way, it was an invention in a way that was forced through because of the wars of religion and so on. So what are these sets of institutions? Well, I don't know when we're going to talk about, you know, there can be many types, right? And it can be one, right? It can be many, and so on. So let's not talk about the second, uh, second uh, this was about the state. Let's not just talk about the second aspect that I mentioned, that of nation. What is a nation? Okay. So how, how, do, how could we define what a nation is, right? So what makes you, let's say you're an American, you let's say you're an American. What makes you American? Is it height? Is it color of skin? Is it religion? Is it ethnicity? Is it um, what? Is it ability? Is it education? Is it language even? None of those. So what makes you American? How do you know you're American? Well, I have a passport. Well, what is that passport? That passport is your membership in the state. So what makes you American? In many ways, it's citizenship. Citizenship is the tool that defines your national identity. So what happens if the government crumbles? What happens if there, if there is no, no, no more United States? What do you become? Okay. But that's a good question to ask. That's a good question to ask. And this is why in, um, on Canvas I posted um, another material, support material for this lecture, which takes you through those maps of Europe that we looked at briefly yesterday, but century after century since uh, the year 800 AD to 1900, and look at them, study them, to show you the, um, a, a very interesting case study, right? Actually a comparison between two case studies. One is that of France, and one is that of, well, what today is Germany. And right? we look back. So why are these important? Because they show you two different ways of national 
definition of the birth of constructing a national identity. Because nations, is, as we understand them to get to today, were invented, were defined by the, the apparition by the modern state. The state defines the nation. Of course, built on other elements that pre-exist the state. So what's the, what's the major difference? If you go through those maps and look, look uh, after, you know, I started with Charlemagne because Charlemagne had a kingdom that covered today's France, today's Belgium, today's Netherlands, to, today's Luxembourg, today's Germany, today's Switzerland, today's Northern Italy, today's of course, th these didn't exist, right? But he had all this. And uh, then I, this is the year 800. Go to year 900 and you'll see the appearance of a Western Frankish, not French, right? This is the Germanic tribe. Western Frankish uh, uh, kingdom, an Eastern Frankish kingdom, then some Burgundia here and whatever here and so on. And I mentioned yesterday that if you pay attention, this actually is the border that later will separate what? Germany from France. Because this separation, which was just political then, not cultural, will become also cultural because these Germanic tribes will develop a Latin-based language, which will then later be French, and these Germanic tribes will develop a Germanic language, uh, an Anglo-Saxon, a Saxon language, right? and that will be German, and so on, and then you have Dutch, which is actually a Germanic dialect, guess, guess what? because they were a Germanic tribe. So these things will develop differently for various historical reasons. Right? But if you just go then gradually and get to 1200, because that's, or 1300, which, are, which is another key point, you will see what we noticed yesterday also, that, again, this is Western Europe. Of course, it's Spain and whatever. This is Western Europe. And you will see a constant reality of a constant, the constant reality of a constant political control over this territory that we associate with France. The borders change, and you have, you know, as we explained, how you know these weren't set borders, whatever, and we're, you know, map makers just use this modern concept to make sense of the world before there are no borders in the world. Just fly the plane, and you'll see. Um, you know, physically. <laughs> These are conventions. So, Fran but you see, however, a, a constant appearance of this entity controlled more or less central in a more or less centralized way by a strong king. And in fact, this kingdom of France throughout history will develop as a more centralized state in the sense that the power was concentrated in a one hand of the king than in other places. In other places you will not have a strong king managing to control, to impose his will over the nobles. You know, read Shakespeare and you see, you know, Richard III and all these things, all those, why did they, why were they fighting? Because there was no central, strong enough central authority, or there was one, but remember, what was the guarantee of permanence, because people live and die, the king lives and die, is that he has a son to which, to which he gives the crown, and what's that? A dynasty. And that dynasty gives permanence, gives, gives continuity to this regime, because there's no constitution. It is the dynasty that maintains it. Yeah? Well, go through the centuries and you see that this shape more or less will remain the same. In the sense that there was a, you know, a, a, a continuous political, continued political rule there in, in, in coherent dynasties. It didn't fall apart. Go to the right. <laughs> Right? What do you see? You see this, and you noticed yesterday in the maps, on the maps, and our discussion, what were these? These were all kinds of Germanic, right? Princedoms, bishoprics, cities, each with their own ruler, their own law, their own sphere of interest, you know, projecting their sphere of interest, loosely bound, more or less, sometimes with into this. Holy Roman Empire of German language, it was called. It was basically a formal institution after, you know, 12, 1300. You know, they, several, seven uh, of the more, most powerful princes around here elected, elected someone to be emperor, really by the end of the Roman Emp Holy Roman Empire, which was 1816 or so. Uh, you know, uh, some, uh, some rulers just gave it to their spouse, you know, yeah, you'll be the emperor. 
Uh, so it wasn't uh, a, a, cons uh, you know, a consistent reality. However, there was this Holy Roman Empire of the German language. But what it was, actually, it was this patchwork of many different uh, spheres of power. And this is going to be the conti continuous reality. And then you have Reformation. And this is a very important part, uh, think uh, phenomenon in, in Europe, as I, as I mentioned, because it does what? It, reinforce, it, it reinforces uh, fragmentation. For example, this is why you have wars of religion, because uh, the different, um, these different religions become different, different, you know, different ways of life, changing from one shared view of the world into very different and you want to impose those values that this new view of life uh, brings in. You know, the reformers, you know, Calvin in Geneva, he was a dictator. He was a dictator because he imposed this, this his rule. And think about, you know, our discussion of political philosophy and my remarks about the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence, for example, just like any other document that describes an order, there, it's based on a philosophy. It's based on a religion. These are the same thing, in a way. Right? It's 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 a description of the of order because they all start with the idea that it is self-evident that all men are created equal. Really, what is that? Right? What does it mean? That's a statement of anthropology, of of philosophical anthropology, of theology. All men are created equal. You describe how the world works. That's an assumption. Now, here comes another person with a different view of the world. He's going to say it is self-evident ob self that not all men are equal, but the tall ones are more equal than the, 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 the short ones. Right? Or the whites and uh, whatever, or the races, or whatever. That's a different view of the world. And you're going to say, well, they're, they're wrong. But they're going to say the same about you. Understand that every... This is why political philosophy is fascinating, is because it shows you that every single political order is not a given but it is based on very clear assumptions. So that's what happened in the world of religion, which means that, and then they had to reach a peace. Well, guess what? In France, they were settled by whoever the king went with. And there was some civil war, but actually the king decided we go with this religion, that's, that's what remained. Here, however, where you have all kinds of small princedoms, guess what? This is where the wars of religion mostly happened, because each of them took a different side. Right? And then try to, you know, you spread democracy, you spread your spread your ideas, right? Or you impose your ideas that maybe your people don't want it. So this is where the wars happened, mostly. And it was devastating. And then you have the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, as we discussed, where what? They decide that, listen, let's, let's enforce sovereignty. Let's enforce the fact that the borders that exist need to remain sovereign. And that will and, and how do you do that, though? How do you combine this with a different religion? They found a very simple solution. The solution was cuius regio eius religio. That's Latin. Which means that whoever has the rule has the religion. Each prince was given the power to impose his own constitution slash view of the world. Because otherwise there's no... And what's that? That's sovereignty. That's sovereignty. So again, sovereignty is good because it creates peace, but it also creates authorities that are unique, that you have to obey. This is why today there's this big debate about intervening in other countries, as is, you know, which means states. Right? Why? Because we have this principle of sovereignty. But what if there's, there's a genocide? But there's sovereignty, right? There's a clash. Um, and what if their constitution allows for genocide, as in Nazi Germany it did? So. The essence of this is that it further fragments this, re this, this region. Let, let's not forget then that there's also Austria here, which is also Germanic, but not German. There's also Switzerland here, which is majority Germanic, but not German. They're not Germans, right? So, you get to the French Revolution, you have the really invention of the modern state with the French, modern French state. And we talked about this yesterday, how the French state, the revolutionary state, makes everyone equal, creates citizenship by imposing equality on every single individual, by, and, then by, and then by defining this membership. Everybody's member in me, in, my, in me being the state, 
And it's me who decides that they're all equal. It's the state who enforces this equality of relationship. But what happens here? Well, <laughs> there are fewer of these, but still plenty. And then you have Napoleon, and you still have plenty of states. And they enter into a sort of a loose confederation of Germanic states with Austria, with Prussia, who is the biggest, bigger actor, still Germanic, and other Germanic states. But they look here, and they see that this modern state is very efficient. There's Napoleon. The France is very efficient. France beats everyone in with Napoleon, right? When you, sh you see that this, this new invention of a strong set of institutions that can mobilize the resources of the entire territory and force all the population to walk in good step, right? This is a powerful reality. So Prussia will push for the creation of a unified quote unquote Germany. But what is this Germany? Because in France, who were, how was Frenchness defined? Whoever is within these borders, and this is the essential difference, that when it came to defining the nation as, as us, the French government seemed to use the borders. Not language really, because yeah, they did speak you know, a variety of dialects of French, but not that everywhere. You know, Italian, Spanish here, Portuguese, whatever. Right? But they imposed it, as I mentioned yesterday. They taught everyone the language, and you better become a French person. You better sign up. But what, what do these people do? I mean, let's invent Germany. But what is Germany? Well, the country of the state, right? The state of this nation of Germans. But what is the, what is the German nation? Who defines it? Who says what it is? Because these speak German in Switzerland, these speak German in Austria, and there are many you know, German speaker enclaves to Russian Empire at that point, Bohemia, what will be later Czechoslovakia, what will be later Romania, down to, you know, whatever. Croatia, whatever, which didn't exist as such, because it was under Hungary. Uh, so, how do you then create Germany? What do you have? What, do you, what don't you have? You don't have the, the territory, which was the criterion and the strong state. You want to build it. You want to acquire territory and define it. Well, how do you draw the borders? Well, what do you have left? Well, you have ethnic identity. Meaning what? Well, who's German? Those who speak German, who assume, who recognize themselves as Germans, who recognize themselves in the German traditions and cultures and whatever. What we call ethno-cultural identity or ethnic identity. And that's indeed what happens. This German identity is pushed over most of these pr uh, uh, princedoms, some of them didn't want. Switzerland, Sw the Swiss refused. They didn't recognize themselves as German. We are Swiss, but they speak German, right? But you see, this is the problem with ethnic identity. It's not a straight thing. It's not an absolute. It's not the Lord of the Rings with orcs and hobbits and uh, gnomes or whatever they are. That's the, sometimes we have this view that, oh yeah, you know, every country is like a little elves and these and these and they're all different. Of course not. That's not how the world works. And as Americans, it's easy to understand because you look around and you see diversity and we're all American. What does it mean, right? It's membership in a state. Um, which involves values and stuff, but we'll see how. So this is the birth of German, and go to 1800 and you still see a fragmented you know, patchwork here and a solid state here. Go to 1900 and suddenly you have the German Empire. Because it's in 1870 that Germany is put together. First time, first time, as a state, as such. And based on what criterion? Ethnic. And this is why the two examples are so, so important. These, this, this case study is, is so relevant. Because in France, nation, National identity was, was defined what? On political, on political grounds, on political reasons. What does it mean? It means that the state, this, this set of institutions, already had a, a political reality that preceded the very existence of the nation, in a way. So they just decide, based on this criterion, we define the nation. But that's the way the US is defined. That's the way Canada is defined and to a degree even the United Kingdom. What defines, what is the criterion? The criterion is the political reality of the state, which precedes nation, nationality. 
right? Which precedes this identity of a nation. Because again, what makes you American? It's not race, it's not ethnicity, it's not the language you speak, right? It is your membership in a state. But very different in Germany. In Germany, nationality, nationhood was defined because there was no state. It was a nation in search of a state, and this was a state in search of a nation. So it was defined on ethnic grounds. Meaning, those who are German have a state called Germany. Yeah, but so many people speak German. So how would you do without, with that? Well, think Hitler. Why do you think he expanded? Why do you think the first country he annexed was Austria? And Austrians are not German. They will tell you. They will tell you. 70% of them will tell you. We're not German, we're Austrians. Right? It's a different identity. Ethnic identity. And they are different. Uh, culturally. So, but that's what he did. Why? Because where do you stop if you put the ethnic criteria? Right? So, there are two major ways of defining the nation uh, that we define. But let's go back and then let's start trying to define now, first again, what is a nation. And there are many ways to define, but the, the easy, uh, some of the you know, most synthetic, easiest ways of defining is a nation is a set of people with a, deep, with a shared fundamental identification. A set of people with a shared fundamental identity, meaning it's a group of people who recognize themselves as pertaining of having the same identity. And not only that, and this is the second part, they also try to make it uh, active politically. Nations, by definition, the way we understand them are all in today's world, because it's a word of quote-unquote nation-states, states that also correspond with nations, right? And we have this idea that each nation needs to have a state. Not true in the world, actually. But because of this, today's ethnic groups, or today, whatever groups that have a shared fundamental uh, identification, those which also seek to govern themselves, so seek political um, self-determination, we call them nations. So a set of people with a deeply shared fundamental identification who seek political self-determination. So what, what could be this common identity, right? You know, let's think of different things. Well, it, what are the elements of this sh that, that people sh can share as a common national identity? Well, it can be cultural. Yeah, Austrians recognize themselves. And it can be political, right? Citizenship, like Canadians. What makes you Canadian? Right? It's citizenship. So it's your political identity that defines your nationhood. This is why in America we confuse the words nationality with citizenship. They're not the same thing. Someone can be a German national, the way Germans understand nationality based on ethnic basis, but not a German citizen, because he, all his ancestors have been in the Czech Czechoslovakia, you know, Czech Republic, Bohemia, in those territories. But he's an ethnic German, hence he's part of the German nation. But he's never lived in the state of Germany. Why would he? This is the recent dimension. So, cultural, political, or civic dimensions. There can be language. There can be religion. There can be economic order. The way we live together economically is part of our values, right? There can be a shared ancestry, but not, you know, not necessarily real. History, right? We have lived together in the same place, we have developed a common identity. All of these can be part of this, this set of things that make a, a national identity. Some can be there and some might be missing, you know. In Canada, it's definitely not religion, but it's political and civic. Maybe it's even cultural. You recognize yourself as Canadian, but you know, you're Indian, this and that, Inuit or whatever, right? <coughs> ethnically. Uh, or in Germany, well, you better be ethnic German. You know, in fact, until 2000, until 1999 or 2000, uh, when a new law was passed, you could never become a German citizen. Ever. Ever. Unless you were ethnically German. 
which means that you could live there for generations and never become a citizen. Be, be born in Germany, by the way. But you're not an ethnic Jew. This has changed only recently. And watch soccer and watch the German national team and see the effects of this. See how many of those are not of German ancestry. Well, in order to be a player in the German national team, you need to have a German citizenship, right? Uh, which means you need to be, a, until 2000, it meant to be an ethnic German. Blonde, blue eyes, whatever, right? The cliches, right? The orcs and the elves. No, uh, but it meant, however, that you could be born in Germany from, let's say, ethnic Turkish parents for, and, you know, who have been there for two, three generations and not be a German citizen. However, someone could come in yesterday from Russia and become citizen, citizen basically in a couple of months. Why? Because he's an ethnic German. Because he has lived in a part of Russia where there have been for centuries ethnic Germans. Back when the states were not so keen on being pure. Yeah. So, two ways then to define uh, nationality basically on uh, political grounds and on ethnic grounds. And they're not exclusive, right? The French is, 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 was born as a political politically defined national, national identity through citizenship, through the territory, through the existence of the territory. However, it also becomes cultural because they then enforced everyone to speak French. Forced everyone to speak French. Same here. You, you know, it's not a requirement to speak English, but in a way, it becomes. It becomes a requirement to play with, by the rules, to, to also assume this culture to a degree. So, we, we mentioned this key word, ethnicity, so let's, let's spend uh, a little bit of time on it. Um, but before we do that, let me again repeat the definition of a nation. A nation is a set of people with a deeply shared fundamental identification who seek political self-rule. Or it can be a group defined upon ethnic, cultural, and political criteria. Or uh, it can be an essential division between us and them uh, an essential dimension of uh, personal identity, or as Connor defines it in 1994, it's a community of understanding, of communication, and of trust. That kind of thing. So let's go now to ethnicity. Because you mentioned this, and it's important to understand. So, ethnicity, how do we say that someone is of a certain ethnicity? Not the same with race, by the way. Sometimes it's a mistake <coughs> here. So what are the elements of ethnicity that you recognize as defining ethnicity? What is a German, right? So language clearly is one. But language, language, remember, language itself is a reality that, like anything, in, everything in history has been developed. There hasn't been always a German language, right? In fact, what we call today the German language was standardized <coughs> through Luther's translation of the Bible into German and then spreading the, the you know, with the Gutenberg's a printing machine at the same time, those two things happening at the same time spread books that were written in the same way using the same kinds of words and that standardized country to the standardizing German language. Later other writers, it's the writers who created the language. <coughs> Famous writers Goethe, Schiller, and then philosophers Hegel, Kant and others, right? They create the language, right? So it, it becomes standardized and then it becomes imposed on others. The same with Italian. Italian is a dialect from the Italian peninsula, from the peninsula, which was imposed when the Italian state was formed, by the way, around the same time as the German state, was imposed on all of them. <coughs> and they're not very happy. Even worse, Spain. Spanish is a dialect spoken on that peninsula, and trust me, you go to the Basque part of, of, of uh, Spain, to the Catalan part, they speak very different language, literally different. It's not it's not even remotely close to Spanish, the Basque language. And they recognize themselves as not Spanish. And that's a part of today's Spain. And the Spanish government is not happy. So Spanish is a dialect imposed on the, by the state, guess what? In this attempt to create a nation. And the Catalans next month will have an, a, a referendum that the state, the Spanish state, does not recognize for independence, for secession from Spain on the model of the Scottish in the, the referendum that happened uh, a month ago. If you're familiar with soccer, to, to go with the same parallel, the club FC Barcelona is a Catalan club. At their games, almost at every game, there is a moment in the game when the entire crowd 
chant the, the, the anthem of Catalonia. Because it's, uh, Barcelona is looked as the, their army of warriors against the Spanish rule. So these are not at all past realities to the country. Um, or think Quebec and Canada. Is Quebec Canada? Right? <coughs> so, what are the aspects? Language, history, not necessarily true, right? Not, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that it, there needs to be a common history. What does it mean? There are other people who lived before. But it needs to be a story that is accepted by this community that we call ethnic group of, of having a common past. Ancestry, again, not necessarily true, but it has to have be something accepted. We recognize ourselves because that we come from the same descendants. Well, do we really? How do we not? Right? We don't have the DNA charts for every single individual. Um, shared myths, shared geography, so space. By the way, geography, space is very important for the definition of nation itself as well, right? Shared culture. Right, culture which can be high culture, works of literature, or low culture, from <coughs> in the sense the common everyday culture, in the sense of the food you eat, these traditions, how you dress in the villages, the dances, the music, you know, this sort of a common treasure of uh, uh, communication. Right? So all this can be elements of ethnicity, but language is key. Religion also can be right one of them. For example, what's the difference between Serbians and Croats? <coughs> Don't quote me on this. But they, they speak the same language. They live in adjacent territories. So what is the real difference? Same language. Well, they say we have different history, different whatever. But it's, you want to tell them apart, it's religion. Croats are Catholic, Serbians are Orthodox. That's it. That's the, that's the thing that you can really point to. And when you have the worst thing you can say, remember this. This is how they differentiated in, in, in many, in many places in Bosnia, where you couldn't otherwise tell who was what. And in fact, in Bosnia, people in two centuries ago became Croats, became Serbians, became Bosnians, because there were three major different identities. The language was common. But there were the Orthodox, there were Catholics, there were Muslims. It wasn't that the Muslims fought the Orthodox or the Catholics, it's, it's not it. It wasn't the war of religion at all would be obviously absurd. Uh, it was an ethnic war in Yugoslavia in the 90s. Only that the ethnic definition was based on religion. <coughs> Not based, but that was the identifier. So, so what is then the relationship between, to go back to state and nation, what is the relationship between state and nation? You saw the map of the world, we have, I don't know, 200 states around the world or some, some such. <coughs> Do it doesn't mean that we have 200 nations, of course. Of course not. How about the Kurds? There is a Kurdish nation, ask the Kurdish people. We, call, could we even call them the Kurdish people. Well, they, do they have a state? No. Do they want a state? Yes. There are many. How's, how about the, the um, Tatars in Crimea? They are an ethnic group. They consider themselves a nation. Why? Because they want self-rule. Right? But why would they want self-rule? You see, we have thrown a huge stick of dynamite into the world. Think of Africa. The continent of Africa. Here's the continent of Africa. How does it look usually? You see, again, nice little you know, shapes. These are the states, right? Very nice. Nicely divided. Of course not. In Nigeria, this is Nigeria, say. In Nigeria, there are 200 tribes, ethnic groups, languages, and so on. N s different religions. The north is mostly Muslim, the south is mostly uh, Christian, but of many kinds. And this is not divided neatly like, oh, here you have, you know, group A, group B, group C. No. It's all mixed up. In this very part, you can have 100 ethnic tribal groups of different identities. So what is then in Nigeria? Because these tribal groups don't end at the border, you know, here's this tribal group, here's this tribal group, here's this one. M many times you have, they have more here. These are artificial borders. You remember how the states in Africa were, were born? They were the remnants of the colonial era. 
colonial era, which meant that countries from Europe went there, ran, ran the territory, exploited it, and when they left, they helped them <coughs> or allowed them, or you know, they were uh, forced to leave, whatever. But what w was left was these new inventions, which was the European invention in many ways, of the modern state. So let's apply this model of a nice nation state, quote unquote, to a reality that is actually tremendously complicated, right? All kinds of groups, all kinds of languages, all kinds of, how do you draw, the, this is a nation, how? They are completely artificial construct, right? So in Nigeria, as I gave you this example, and I'm sorry for the scribblings, but it gives you a, a sense, a very visual sense of the messiness, right? If you want clear cut. But the world it was never clear cut. We tried to apply this, shape it by force, uh, with this tool of the state. So in Nigeria, it is more difficult to relocate to a different province than to a different country. Because the ethnic differences are so harsh. You will not do welcome there. In the same, in the same state, quote unquote. So what is a Nigerian? Is there such a, an identity? Well, politics does create identity, just like the establishment of the United States colonies and the United States created an identity, which was both through political tools, and then became also cultural. You know, sign up to the same set of documents, right? That's the culture, you know, the, the constitution, whatever, right? <coughs> so, there is, you know, or think Iraq the same example, right? Is there, what is an Iraqi? Because we see about Shia, Sunni, Kurds, right? Kurds are don't consider themselves Iraqi, they're not ethnically. Shia and Sunni are different religions. And then there are other groups. And so what is there? Is there an Iraqi, Iraqi identity? Partially yes, partially not, because these are not exclusive. Just like a Scottish person can also be British, but there are Scottish people who don't consider themselves British, but only Scottish, right? In the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom being formed of different self-assumed uh, nations. So, it's not, it's a complicated world, isn't it? But what I want you to understand is this, there is what the state is separate from and distinct from what the nation is. And to go back to the, to the our discussion of the state and um, of the political unit, which is the state, right? We talked about the fact, what is it? The set of institutions with exclusive power over territory and membership. This is the state. Now, another important term that we will use in this class is political system. What is the political system? If the state is this, the political system, I told you that the state is a set of institutions in charge of. The political system it describes how, what kind of institutions are there and how power is distributed between them. So the political system is the byword or is the expression for that describes the institutions of the state. How many there are, what power they have, what relationships they have between them. That's the political system. In other words, you can have uh, uh, a political system that has what? A legislature, has an executive, has a judiciary, and they have specific powers where the president is directly elected, and that's the political system, that's, uh, uh, that's the, the specific political system, for example, in the US. In the US, the president is separately elected from the, from the uh, parliament, and it doesn't matter if you can see this, the idea, right? The political system is how these institutions are distributed, what is are the relationship between them? Because not all states are democracies, not all states have the same types of institutions, but they always have a set of institutions that run the territory. And we call, some states we call failed states. Why do we call them failed? Because they fail, right, they fail to do what the state does, to control exclusively the territory and the membership. And Mexico was accused, <coughs> well, accused, it was uh, discussed that Mexico is close to becoming this a failed state because there are parts of Mexico where the government, the set of institutions, does actually not, doesn't actually rule, doesn't actually control the territory and the membership. But you have different gangs. Colombia was in this situation with parts of Colombia, huge parts, were actually run by a guerrilla group. And remember, 
that means that the state doesn't have sovereignty because there's an internal rival who has sovereignty within that territory. So the political system is how the specific institutions of the state are arranged, distributed, the power relationship between them. And when we talk about different types of political systems, which can be democratic, non-democratic, whatever, right? It can be one, let's say there's a tyrant who rules alone, that's a political system. It, it, it's, it's one institution, you know, tyranny, right? Autocracy, we'll talk about it. Totalitarian. We'll talk about democratic w uh, systems, right? Presidential is the system we have in the US. Parliamentary is the system that there is in the UK because it's different dis distribution of powers, although the institutions might seem, might seem similar. They're, and they're both democratic. But that's the political system, and that's different from the state. It's what type of regime rules in a, in a state. How these institutions are assembled. And finally, there's this other word that I wanted to clarify <coughs> for yourself and use correctly, which is government. If the state is this ongoing reality of a territory and membership ruled by a set of institutions, if the political system is how these institutions are actually set up, the government is literally just the people who, act, who are in power at a, at a given time. Government, let's use it from now on this way, is the set of people in power in this political system over the state at a given time. <coughs> so, as you can see, there are, these are three different realities. <coughs> and to give you an example, France, as you've seen, has been <coughs> territorially more or less the same for six, seven centuries. It has had numerous political systems. Only in the last 200 years, it has been an empire, it has been a kingdom, it has been a commune, it has been uh, democratic regimes, it has had five types. All democratic, but differently arranged. And they actually called the French First Republic, Second Republic, Third Republic, Fourth Republic. Today we are in the Fifth Republic because the political system changed. But the state remained the same. This France persists. How we arrange, how we govern ourselves, monarchy, this and that changes. And obviously government can change within the political system. The political system in the US has been fairly the same since what? Since the Constitution. In the US, the state and the political system were born together because it was a brand new state which also defined how we live together. Did the government, has the government changed in the last 200 years? Yes, numerous times. So as you see, what is the easiest reality? What is the reality of these three that is easiest to change? Obviously, government. What does it take to change the government? Well, in a democracy, elections. Fine, it's good. What does it take to change a political system? Right? To not have it, you know, to change the constitution in the sense that you don't have president, you have from now on prime minister and whatever. Well, it can take either a change in constitution, which is the, a major change of constitution, it changes the whole, no longer congress, we have an assembly of elders or whatever, right? Or maybe just one house of parliament, or maybe just a dictator in the house of parliament or whatever. That can, that's a different political system. Or the Congress becomes the most powerful and president becomes just a you know, figurehead which can be dismissed whenever by Congress. That's a different political system. What does it take to change that? A change in the Constitution and or revolution. Revolutions change the, the, the political system. In the Arab Spring, <coughs> in Africa, Middle East, uh, North Africa, a few years ago, what did they change? Did they change Egypt? No, they changed the political system from a dictatorship to hopefully a democracy, it didn't turn out that way, and so on. That's a revolution. Right? How do you change a state? You don't change it through elections, you elect Obama or Bush or whoever, the United States doesn't crumble, hopefully. Right? Uh, it doesn't, uh, you don't change it by, with a revolution, because just changing <coughs> the way we govern ourselves doesn't change the state. I told you about the example of France, they move from absolute monarchy to revolution to Napoleon, France remained the same. So a political system can be changed and the state remains the same. So the, this is the hard, the, the, the reality is the hardest to change because it takes what? Secession, state civil war in the US. It takes invasion, yeah, when you're taken over and the state ceases to exist, right? So that's about what it is. <coughs> invasion or secession. States don't really fall apart, disappear. Yeah. So, Hardest, hard, 
easy, <laughs> more or less. Okay, so we talked about the state, we talked about the nation, we talked about ethnicity, we talked about political system, and we talked about government. These are the main concepts I want you to focus on beside, uh, uh, based on this um, lecture. Uh, watch it, take notes, send me your questions in the uh, open discussion forum uh, if something is unclear, and use the maps because they're very easy. Also read the Danziger chapter and I will post a few of these definitions as well.